Maggie looks around New York from the other side of the river. The city that never sleeps is motionless and eerily quiet, except for the moans of a huge horde of walkers wandering through the streets of a dead city. The animated opening credit sequence tells about the fall of New York. Fifteen years earlier, during Operation Cobalt, the U.S. military blew up the bridges and tunnels of the city to contain a zombie virus spreading like wildfire. Cut off from the mainland, Manhattan has become an island of the dead. It's been years since Maggie and Negan last saw each other in The Walking Dead, and she spent the last few months tracking down Negan at the motel and cocktail bar of Azista and Motors. He sat down in this roadside hole, doing the job of a cleaner, clearing the walking surroundings of a gloomy institution. Maggie drops her book with a map when she rushes in pursuit of a frightened Negan, who is accompanied by a young Ginny. I thought you were better on your feet, Maggie says to Negan, putting her legs to his throat after he blocked the blow with a crowbar. It's good to see you too, Nigan grins. The wanted poster wipes the grin off his face. If you have any information about this person, report to any office of the Marshals of New Babylon. Do not approach unless armed. Negan proudly puts a wanted poster in his pocket. She asks where Negan's wife, Annie, and their child are, but he refuses. He tells Ginny, who says nothing, that he and Maggie are old acquaintances, and now he understands that she did not come to kill him. Maggie tells how a few weeks ago a Croat raided her house in bricks. Horvath's gang outnumbered and overpowered Maggie's men, stealing their grain and setting up a monthly extortion schedule. As collateral, they took a hostage, the son of Maggie and Glenn Herschel. She tracked them down on the Hudson, but they managed to cross the river and get to Manhattan. Maggie needs Negan to help save her son from a Croat who was kicked out of the asylum for being too violent even for the rescuers of Negan. There were a lot of psychos in my team back then, says Negan, but he always stood out because he was an exceptionally crazy son of a bitch. Why should I help you? Because you owe me, Maggie tells him, you're the last person I wanted to ask for help. But it looks like you don't have that many options. Because if I found you here, so did the marshals. They get in the car and hit the road to Manhattan. Along the way, they meet hanged people who have recently turned into zombies. After smuggling Negan and Ginny out of New Babylon, the capital of the New Babylonian Federation, Marshal Pulley Armstrong is not far behind them. Marshal Armstrong receives a tip from the owner of the bar and throws her to walkers outside the motel for the death penalty code 14, section 8 aiding and abetting. Negan is wanted for the cold-blooded murder of a marshal and four other men. According to Armstrong, who is going to execute Negan under code 14, section 2 of the new Babylonian law, there is nothing so magnanimous as hanging or beheading. For what this man has done, he will be hung upside down and sawed in half, from groin to head, very, very slowly. On the way, Nigan says that about a year ago he was working on a farm when the marshals raided there. Ginny asked to leave with Negan, taking nothing with her except the most valuable, a stuffed dinosaur. She hasn't spoken since someone brutally murdered her father. Maggie agrees to give Ginny a house in bricks. In a farming settlement that the settlers founded at an old brick factory, in exchange for Nigan's help in saving Fur's Hal. Negan understands that Maggie can't kill him, if I die, you won't get your son back. You need me. Gritting her teeth, Maggie reminds him that this is about both sides. And I'm sure the marshal has something to say about this. He is not entirely guilty of the crimes he is accused of, and he believes that he paid for what he did. Accompanied by Marshal Fritz and Giano, Armstrong tracks the duo to Jersey City, using Maggie's book with a map as a guide. Torn pages give their destination, Manhattan. Confused, Armstrong unfolds the note. Joel Armstrong, Oliver Street. Ept. 505. Envi. Maggie and Nine manage to take Giano hostage, using the junior marshal as insurance to get across the river on a captured boat. But the journey is not easy. Tension builds until Negan turns to Maggie about her increasingly reckless behavior. I understand that because Herschel was taken away, you spun, stirred up emotions, memories, all sorts of shit. But the vengeful thoughts that I thought you'd left behind. It's obvious you're awake, damn it. But what I don't understand is that after all these years, 
you still think I'm the bad guy. It's not like that. But you know what, Maggie, ask yourself one question, how many husbands and fathers have you killed? Maggie, already suffering from then induced nightmares about Glenn's death, replies, what you did, you will never put to bed. On Manhattan Island, Maggie and Negan go to town with Giano in tow. Where are all the walkers? He asks, and that's a good question, there must be more than a million undead wandering around here somewhere. Before they can continue on their way to the building, from which smoke is pouring out at the same time every morning and evening, Negan asks Maggie to look after Ginny. Suddenly it starts raining corpses. Revived walkers fall from the floors above, collapsing on the street below like hail in human growth. Someone controls an asphalt paver, turning on music and leading a horde of walkers like a Pied Piper, forces the trio to take refuge in the laundry room. Armstrong gives chase, accidentally shoots Giano and kills him when he opens fire on Negan. Armstrong tells Maggie that he is a law-abiding man who wants to return to his wife and three daughters, only he needs Negan. When walkers flood the laundry room, Maggie's fight with Armstrong almost turns deadly. I need him to save my son, she explains, fighting off the marshal, but he continues to strangle her. But she eventually manages to escape with Negan. Elsewhere, Herschel is tied to a chair in a dark room. Look at you, acting so cool. Just like your mother. Or maybe his father. The Croat scoffs. Tell me, have you ever met the man who killed your father? He lived among your mother's people for many years, Nigan. What do you know about him? The torturer continues his monologue, digging in his toolbox. When I was a boy, I was fascinated by Manhattan. All these people on such a small island. Pushing, shoving. The irony is that, dying, the city becomes much more alive than ever. Because the struggle spiritualizes you, shows you the strength that has been inside you all this time. You know, I think you'll like it here. Horvath menacingly places the blade on Herschel's leg, apparently intending to torture him, but one of his men interrupts him, informing him that someone has escaped. On the roof, a terrified man, covered with cuts and other signs of torture, is desperately looking for an escape route. Having told the man that there is nowhere to run, the Croat says that he just wants to find out information about his community. The man tries to get over the zip line to another building, but the Croat cuts the zip line, causing the man to crash to death. The sadistic Croat jokes that the fall of a man from a height of 20 floors became a new record, but at the same time he remained much deader. Meanwhile, Maggie and Negan stumble upon a strange woman in the Manhattan neighborhood. Walkers try to break into the room where Maggie and Negan are hiding. Esther stole all their things. They get out through a hole in the ceiling and follow Esther, where she climbs the elevator shaft. The walker falls into a pile at the bottom of the mine, and Negan tells Maggie that it's just fun to spend time with you, isn't it? Maggie and Negan climb the stairs after Esther, who escapes into another building using a zip line, hitting Negan. To their surprise, Esther sends Hook back to them and tells Maggie and Negan to follow her. They move to the zip line, Maggie barely manages to avoid the walkers who have flooded the building. Suddenly, the same music they've heard before starts playing, and Maggie gets stuck at the other end of the zip line, hanging over the teeming walking streets of Manhattan. Maggie overcomes the rest of the way, rejecting Negan's help, and they go inside the building they reached. Nina brings Ginny to the new Hilton, which is now a series of buildings located on a large rural area. Ginny pays special attention to one of the residents who climbed the grain silo. Mr. Aizawa introduces Ginny to a class full of children, telling them that Ginny has come to them from Oceanside and will now study in their class. The class reacts to the news with muted enthusiasm and tells Jenny to take a seat while he does the feed. Maggie and Negan climb inside through the window and find the tester in a large room sorting through their belongings. Although Maggie protests against her actions, Negan allows her to leave something, and Esther offers them some food in exchange. Negan asks the old woman to take them to the building where the smoke is coming from, but she protests in Hebrew, which, according to Negan, means hell no. Negan tells Maggie that they can either go back or see how the sisters' events unfold, but if they come back, then the only thing waiting for them is the herd and the marshal's bullets. Maggie reluctantly agrees, and Esther calls them to follow her. At a dry cleaners in Manhattan, Pully wakes up and sees his rifle on the floor and walkers wandering around the room. Pully prepares to go for his weapon, 
but the zombified Grits walks past him, forcing Pulley to change his mind. While the walkers continue to move around the laundry room, Pulley looks at the envelope with Joel Armstrong's address in Manhattan again. Esther leads Maggie and Negan down the stairs, where Oma and Tamaza aim modified nail guns at them, and Esther tries to defuse the situation. Negan immediately disarms, followed reluctantly by Maggie, while Oma and Tamaza argue about the old woman continuing to bring people they should accept. I guess they're not with Croats, Maggie comments, and Negan sarcastically agrees with her. Negan interrupts the argument, admitting that they don't know each other and may not be friends, but he doubts that Esther brought them here to kill them. Tamaza claims that there are thousands of them and they own this city, but Amaya asks what they are trying to achieve, pointing out that it is quite obvious that Maggie and Negan are not local. Maggie claims they were heading north to a settlement in Canada when their boat washed ashore in Manhattan during a storm, and they're only here to get supplies and hit the road again. However, Maya does not believe Maggie's story and Esther argues with her while Tamaza disarms them. Tamaza takes Maggie and Negan through the Manhattan tribal hideout, forces Luther to search Maggie's bag and, to Negan's annoyance, locks them in an old bathroom. In the hilltop, Nina tries to help her wife get comfortable, sympathizing with her that she found herself in an unfamiliar place with strangers and promising that someday these people will become a family for Ginny. Nina persuades Ginny to eat and tells the girl to come get her if she needs anything. However, a frustrated Ginny just covers her legs with Negan's jacket and cries. In the flashback, Maggie enters Herschel's room and reprimands him for missing the weapons training again, at which Lane brought Bo's staffs. This is the third time in a month that Herschel has missed a workout, and Maggie is trying to emphasize how important it is to always be ready. I'm more interested in drawing, Herschel dismissively tells his mother that he has it, but Maggie warns her son that this is not a joke and that people can attack you with anything. Then I'll probably be dead, Herschel remarks gloomily. Maggie praises one of Herschel's drawings, but he crumples it up, tells Maggie that it sucks and leaves Xander, to the horror of Maggie, who takes Herschel's drawing. In the present, Negan says that they had no choice but to surrender, since the people about mine had weapons, which means that they would have been killed if they resisted. But Maggie thinks they could have fought back and not been in jail. Negan is sure that they are here because of Maggie's obvious lies, and suggests that they should have told the truth so that both sides would calm down. Negan admits that, rightly or wrongly, these people had their own reasons for locking up Maggie and Negan, which, according to Negan, makes them useful in terms of manpower and information. Maggie notes that Negan was supposed to be a source of information, but so far he has been quite secretive about the Croats. An emotional Nigan finally explains that just when the world turned into a soup of shit, a Croat, so to speak, appeared at my door. He went through. Well, let's just say he's been through some really bad shit. The worst shit imaginable. So I took him in. Saved him from the brain drawing on the walls. Very soon he started calling me his brother Buras. He said he felt safe because of me. I think at that moment everyone was looking for shelter from the hellfire in which we were all cursed, because we lost everything. Maggie guesses that you need to be a monster to make a monster, but Negan corrects her, you see, I was a monster only when I needed it. When I had to put on a show to protect my people. In any case, the Croat could read people, and then play with them and tear them apart. When it was necessary to cope with a threat, these skills were very useful to me. Maggie realizes that Horvath was Negan's tormentor, but Negan admits that he went too far. It was one of our first encounters with the kingdom, before your time. One man hid in a car a couple of miles from the shelter. It seemed to me that she was a tramp who had nothing to do with us or what we were up to. So I gave a direct order. Let him go. Horvath, he saw it differently. Thought she had beans she could spill. And he was right, she was a scout. At least that's what she admitted before he did. She was still a child. So, after that, I realized that he was a rabid dog that needed to be put down. I had one shot. One. I missed. I shot off his ear, the rest is gone. I haven't seen or heard from him since. Until now, of course. Maggie understands that this means that Horvath will want to kill Negan, 
which he confirms. Maggie is angry that Negan didn't tell her about this earlier, but Negan notes that he knows how Horvath acts. Police sneaks into Joel's apartment and breaks open the locked door, blocking the opening with a chest of drawers, after hearing the growling of walkers nearby. In the kitchen, Pulley finds a lot of scattered empty food cans, which suggests that Joel once ran out of food, and drug paraphernalia on the stove. In the dust-covered living room, Pulley finds a photo of himself and Joel, who turns out to be his brother, and an empty gun case. Looking at a photo of herself and Joel with her parents, Pulley notices a corpse in the bedroom behind the mirror. Pulley discovers that Joel died from a self-inflicted gunshot to the head, presumably committing suicide after running out of supplies and being left to starve. Pulley regretfully covers her brother's body with a sheet and puts Joel's rosary beads on top of it. Taking Joel's loaded pistol, Pulley is about to leave, but discovers that walkers are trying to get through the door. Pulley climbs out of the window and down the stairs, but gets caught in the net. In the shelter, Maggie and Negan hear panicked screams, and Tameza grabs them, accusing them of being to blame. Omai's people are frantically packing up because the Berzians are approaching, and Tamaza believes that Maggie and Negan brought them to the shelter, wanting to kill them for it. Negan tries to calm the situation by telling me that they are not with Barazi and are arguing with Tamaza, and then puts a sharp and deep bone to his throat. Threatening to kill Tamaz with it before letting him go and repeating that he and Maggie are here to help them. When the cars drive up to the house, and Maya returns Maggie and Negan's belongings and weapons. Maggie suggests they wait if it's Horvath's men, but Negan knows it's a bad idea if the Barasi beat them to it. Several Barazi armed with homemade metal spears enter the shelter, and Maggie and Negan and quickly Negan hide. Boris approaches them to find them, but instead he rushes after another survivor who runs past. Climbing the stairs, they find one of O.M.'s men dead, Bura's spear pierced her chest. Omai's men are fighting several more. On the ground are the bodies of another of their people and the dead Bura's. Omai uses his claw hammer, which shoots a grappling line, to rip out a piece of Bura's chest, seriously wounding him, and Luther wrings the neck of another Burao. Having stopped Amaya, Maggie herself finishes off the wounded Bura's, inflicting a cruel blow on his neck. On the roof, the surviving members of the group prepare to escape, but one of the Burris takes Esther hostage. While Negan tries to persuade the man, he continues to mutter home to him, and then suddenly plunges a knife into Esther's chest, killing her to everyone's horror, after which Negan finally subdues the man by crashing his head into a beam. Holding Esther's body in his hands, Tameza, who until that moment seemed only a hot-tempered and angry survivor, burst into tears, and then stabbed Lester in the head with a knife so that she would not come to life. Negan orders everyone else to escape through the zip line while he deals with the captured Buras. However, Maggie follows Negan back inside. When the new Buratsis arrive, Negan pushes his captive's head through several glass windows, shouts knock knock and puts a knife to the throat of a man on the balcony of the second floor of the shelter. Under Maggie's supervision, Negan makes fun of one of the Buratsis, and then delivers one of his mocking speeches. Knock, knock, who's there? Get out your umbrellas because it's going to fucking rain soon. Negan cuts his captive's throat, splashing the people below with his blood, and then brutally dismembers him, spraying even more blood over Baraza. I don't know if any of you have checked today's forecast, but if I see even one hair of a mole on your ugly face, it won't just be a downpour. Damn, it's not going to be a thunderstorm, it's going to be a fucking hurricane. Negan throws the body over the balcony, dropping it on the Burasov. Maggie and Negan exchange glances before running out of the shelter. That night at the Hilton Ginny can't sleep, and she still hasn't eaten the sandwich Nina made her. Getting up, Ginny collects her bag, distracts the guard, steals the motorcycle and drives away, after which she looks at the grain bin for a long time again. In another building, Negan removes the glass from her hand while Omaya and her people mourn their losses, in particular the devastated Tamas. Omai and Tamaza thank Maggie and Negan for their help, and Tamaza admits that he lied about there being thousands of them there. His voice breaks, Tamaza says that the people we have lost are everything. This is our family. We've been coming to this for a long time. Amaya says they would have repaid, but there are no supplies here for Maggie and Negan's trip to Canada, everything that is left has already been taken by someone else. Tamaza is sure that it doesn't matter and that their boat has already been sunk, and you can get to the island but you can't get out, because Barazi and their psychopathic leader took care of it. 
After looking at Negan, Maggie finally admits the truth that they are in Manhattan because Horvath has her son. So you want to get to a psychopath? We can help you with this. You know, if you want to die, it's about Maya. Pully continues to struggle in his net while four walkers surround him. The Croat stays with two Buratsis and with the help of spikes on his helmet puts the walkers with blows to the head. The Croat approaches the marshal and says to him with a laugh, Don't worry, you're safe now. When the Croat leaves, Burasi is dragged away by Pearly. The end of the second series. In the flashback, Ginny, armed with a golf club, makes her way through the forest, but she is surprised by a zombie man impaled on a broken tree branch, who seems to have recently died in turn. When Ginny steps back from the walker, Negan stabs him in the head with a knife, laying him on the ground. Negan is furious and tells Ginny that she needs to talk because he can't figure out if Ginny needs help if she doesn't yell at him. All I've been doing for months is trying to find a safe place for you. And you stuck to me like crazy glue's damn glue. I turn away for half a second, and at that time you decide to go for a ride. Noticing the look of Jin's walker, Negan remembers that he tried to kill them the night before and guesses that they are not the only ones he angered. Taking the man's bag, Negan asks Ginny what she is doing here, and Ginny shows him that she has lost her dinosaur. Negan agrees to follow in their footsteps and find him. In the present, Ginny arrives on the banks of the Hudson River, where she finds two corpses, one of which is headless, surrounded by looted equipment, which suggests that they were killed for supplies. Ginny starts paddling down the river to Manhattan in a big yellow cooler, which is among the equipment. Hiding behind a car with Maggie Negan, and Maya bangs two horns, trying to attract a nearby deer. When the deer approaches, Tomaza kills it with her modified claw hammer. In the store, Negan knocks on the bell, but this does not attract walkers. Nigan notices Luther smearing himself with beeswax, but he refuses to give Nigan even a little and works on cutting the deer into usable meat. Amaya studies the map of the city with Maggie and Tamas, and both tribesmen say that most of the streets are too dangerous because of walkers and Croat traps. Negan asks how long they have been doing this, and Amaya explains that they are native New Yorkers who had just become children when the global outbreak broke out. The first few weeks were the worst. It spread so fast. Through the subway, buildings, corpses rose from the ground, fell from the sky. We were all waiting for the army to appear. Hell, anyone. And when they finally showed up, we were so stupid that we thought they would come to save us. And we watched as they blew up bridges, tunnels, leaving us in this deadly trap. Tameza adds that they were going a little bit, until a Croat appeared, who invited people to join him, offering protection and convenience. The Croat wants to ensure their safety in his paranoid version of kill or be killed. Maggie and Negan exchange glances, realizing that this is a perverted version of what Negan and the Saviors did. However, the tribe would never agree to such a deal, so the Croat now kills them, steals from them, kidnaps and tortures them to learn how to kill and steal even more. Only one of the tribesmen managed to get out alive, but it was just luck. Alarmed, Maggie goes to check the alley, Anigan assures the apologetic Amaya that Maggie is tougher than she looks, and she looks tough as shit. Maggie takes a break to collect her thoughts and go outside. Elsewhere, Ginny gets to Manhattan and goes to the ruined city. From the window overlooking Madison Square Garden, which is surrounded by a huge herd, Tomaza informs Maggie and Negan that if you want to get into the crat, you need to go through it. He brings flesh from all over the city. A car passes by, playing music and dragging more and more walkers towards the arena, the same one that Maggie, Negan, and Jaina encountered on their first night in Manhattan. Luther says there is no exit inside the arena, and Maya rejects Maggie's idea of a sewer, because the army stuffed all the walkers they killed into it until they themselves died and turned into walkers, after which the sewer was sealed tightly. Negan remembers that one of the tribesmen got out of Alcatraz, which means that there is a way to get back. Tamaza turns out to be the one who managed to escape, and Amaya offers to show him to Maggie and Negan, but Luther refuses this idea, since it has already been rejected. Amaya recalls their recent losses, but Tamaza supports Luther, since there are even fewer of them than during the first vote, and Tamaza is not sure that he will be able to return there again. 
I have an old feeling of deja vu. 12, 15 years ago there was a guy from the south, appeared out of nowhere, very similar to this guy. Everyone flocked to him because he knew what they needed, what they wanted. Protection. Shelters. So he built a cool fortress. Formed an army of psychopaths. And he made people join in. And if they didn't join, he brought down the hammer on them. Soon people got tired of him, and they got together. And they decided it was time to return the hammer. And Maya and Tamaza are listening with interest, as is Maggie, who recognizes in this story Negan himself, the saviors and his defeat from Alexandria, Hilton, Kingdom and Oceanside. Tamaza asks what happened, and Maggie and Negan reply that the uprising has succeeded. After a while, Tamaza agrees to talk to the others, to Omai's delight and Luther's displeasure. As the group watches on, three cars, including a blood-spattered ambulance, enter the arena. The prisoner Armstrong is taken out of the ambulance. The Croat greets Pulley, who is led past where several Barazzis are loading the body into a tank filled with liquid. Handcuffed to the railing in Horvath's office, Pulley watches some of Horvath's men train near a large ring in the center of the arena. At the tribe's new base in an abandoned restaurant, Tomaza draws a map and explains that sometimes the door to the arena opened and the Croat offered him food or medicine in exchange for a story about the tribe, in particular about how many of them were left and where they were hiding. Tomaza knew that as soon as he spoke, he would be killed, so while the door was opening, let's say there was no more food and medicine, and Negan notices the scars on Tomaza's back. When Tomaza was a child, his grandfather said that he worked in a team that rebuilt Penn Station, and that although people believed that the old station no longer existed, Tomaza's grandfather knew the places where they left the frame hidden behind the walls. One night, when the Barazzis were cleaning Tama's cell of spilled blood, a walker got in there. Tomaza ran as fast as he could, found the frame, and followed the New York subway system to the exit. However, although the cells are located close, Negan knows that after Tama's escape, Horvath would have moved his prisoners, as that is exactly what Negan would have done. Maggie admits that Negan and Horvath know each other, they have known each other for a long time, and Negan knows how Horvath thinks. When they were friends, Negan shot him and shot off the Croat's ear. He can bait him. Lure him out of the arena. Then we'll make him tell me where my son is, and we'll kill him, Maggie says. And Maya agrees that the others should follow Barazi so that the Croat can't chase Maggie, but Luther asks how Negan is going to lure the Croat after he shot off his ear. Negan points out that Horvath will most likely want revenge on him for this, and Maggie insists that it will work, but Luther doubts this, going so far as to abruptly tell Maggie that her son is already dead and he thinks she knows it. Negan interrupts the argument, and a frustrated Maggie leaves. Pearly Burris brings two plates of dinner, a bottle of wine to the luxurious cell and turns on the record player, after which he steps aside. A Croat enters the room and happily greets Pulley by turning on the heating lamp and light. Horvath invites Pulley to have dinner with him, assuring the marshal that it's not magic, I promise. Only science. It was my profession. Alternative energy. So naturally, when I first arrived here, I couldn't help but ask myself what is the richest natural resource on this island. Death. The sewer is full of it. Corpses decompose and produce methane, and since intermolecular forces are weak, this gas can be compressed under pressure and turned into liquid fuel at normal temperature. Amazing, isn't it? What we have built here is a sanctuary. And we welcome everyone. The Croat hands Pulley the key to the handcuffs across the table and asks why he is here and who he brought with him. The Croat can't offer Pulley shelter until he ceases to pose a threat, because first of all in this world we must remain safe. Suddenly, the Croat discovers that the meat on his dish is rotten and there are maggots inside it, and pushes himself away from the table. The Croat is concerned because all kinds of bacteria can be found in rotten meat and without the treatment that humanity once had, it can be deadly. The Croat demands to know why Boris serves him rotten meat, and then interrupts his explanation and forces him to swallow the key to the handcuffs. The Croat violently hits Boris with his head and neck several times into the railing, breaks his neck, kills him, and then throws him over the edge to the floor of the arena and leaves. At the tribal base, Maggie examines a box with old photos of her family, Otis and Patricia, a photo of herself and baby Herschel, 
an old clock and a drawing of Glenn. Negan approaches her and offers her a Yankee hat that he found for Herschel, remembering that Herschel once wore a very similar one. Noticing how upset she is, Negan reassures Maggie that Luther is wrong and her plan will work, offering to talk about it or listen if Maggie needs someone to talk to. When the Croat appeared at our gate, I told Herschel to climb into the root cellar. And he went and grabbed a shovel and a brick, as if it could do something. There weren't many people in this world who meant anything to me, but there were enough of them. And all that's left of them is in this box, Maggie admits with tears in her eyes. In turn, Negan emotionally tells sympathetic Maggie that a few years ago Joshua, Annie, and I lived in a small hut near New Babylon. One day Annie decided to go to the city to do some trading. When she was not at home at dusk, I realized that something had gone wrong. I went to look for her, found her. She was robbed, beaten, and begged me not to do anything stupid, but, damn it, you know me. I found them. All five of them, in some shitty drinking establishment. To be honest, I don't even think I wanted to kill them. After that, we were on the run, and it was very hard for Annie. So I put them on a train to Missouri and said I would follow them. I stayed. I think about them every day. I hope to God that they are all right, and maybe I have no right to hope for that. I don't know, Maggie. I mean, what else do we have besides hope? Joking that she thinks Negan knows how to shut up, Maggie accepts his gift of a hat for Herschel. Ginny runs through the streets of Manhattan teeming with walkers, having close contacts with two different walkers. In the process, Ginny drops her dinosaur toy and a trapped walker reaches out to her. In a flashback, an annoyed Negan tells Ginny that they can't keep looking for the dinosaur toy they've been doing all day. Negan has to find the best place for a young girl, and she has to talk. Negan wants Ginny to answer him when he calls her and let Negan know when she's in trouble. Ginny just shakes her head when Negan asks if she's listening to him, which angers Negan, who tells the girl that if before she could go to a doctor who would help her get through all the terrible shit Ginny went through, now it's gone. So Ginny will have to skip everything that needs to be done and move on to how to stay alive. Realizing that he was too harsh when he saw Ginny crying, Negan admits that the problem is that they don't have any leads or maybe they are around them, and Negan and Ginny just don't see them. In the present tense, the scavenger puts down the walker and picks up Ginny's toy before moving on. Ginny quickly starts following the woman. The tribe sits down to dinner, performing a ritual of laying various items, including Esther's necklace, items belonging to lost loved ones, and singing as a sign of remembrance. After a while, Maggie picks up Glenn's drawing and joins the ritual. In the arena, the cheering crowd chants home to him or we are home in Croatian, and the Croat announces that they are celebrating Buras, who was killed by Nigan, because death is not the end, but rather it is their fuel, because people are a resource. Cheering, some of the crowd accept the methane coming from the corpse, and Horvath forces Pulley to take the methane too before pushing him into the ring. The disoriented Pulley is chained to a pole in the ring, and the zombified Buras, whom the Croat killed earlier, with his head tilted at an angle due to a broken neck, is stuffed together with him. After dodging the walker several times, Pulley manages to grab him from behind, wrap the handcuff chains around the walker's throat and, pinning the walker to a post, drive the chain into his neck hard enough to decapitate a man. The disappointed crowd throws the bottles into the ring, Pulley grabs the broken one and uses it to cut the walker's stomach and get the key from the handcuffs, freeing himself. Two more walkers are shoved into the ring along with Pulley, who is looking for a way out. Not finding him, Pulley takes off his right shoe after hesitating over the left and with it hits the walkers in the face, hitting the Croat. At the restaurant, Tomaza approaches Maggie and confesses that he is scared. Tomaza doesn't understand how Maggie manages to control herself, especially with a child. And Maya, she says it won't be safe in the city with a child. Maggie admits that Amaya is right, that it's not safe, but we need to make it safe somehow, and she does everything that is necessary. Amiya brings a scavenger, whom Tomaza joyfully welcomes. When the woman pulls out her finds, Maggie is shocked to notice Ginny's dinosaur toy among them. She tells the woman that she knows a little girl who loves such toys and the woman gives her to Maggie. In Pulley's cell, 
Horvath congratulates Pulley on the best show this place has seen in recent years, and offers Marshall a towel to clean himself up. Although the Croat claims that he does not like such barbarism, it had to be done. When the world became unstable, my family and I took refuge in the post office. We were starving, and I went to look for food. When I came back, I immediately smelled it. My family, my wife Mia, my daughters Nika and Hannah and my son Philip became food for another starving family. And I was too upset to even think about suicide. By the time it would have occurred to me, I had already found the person who became my new family and taught me how to protect what matters, which makes me wonder what exactly you are protecting in this boot. One of the Buras puts the blade to Pulley's neck, while the other takes off his boot. Inside, Horvath finds an envelope with Joel's address and reads Joel's letter to his emotional brother, in which he begs Pulley for help after everyone changed his phone numbers. Pulley tearfully begs the Croat to stop, admitting that it's only him, since two of Pulley's partners are dead. Pulley says that they came to Manhattan to bring home a wanted man named Nigan. Horvath is shocked to learn that Negan is in Manhattan. In the kitchen of the restaurant, Negan goes through various pots, pans and utensils, and then takes a cheese grater. Luther approaches Negan and explains that he was looking for a weapon that could be taken the next day. Negan knows Luther doesn't like him, but Luther just needs to know that they're on the same side and this plan will work. However, Luther tells Negan that he and Maggie are leaving here tonight, and takes out a wanted poster of Negan, finding it among Negan's belongings, where Negan kept it after he received the poster from Maggie at the motel. Since Negan has people depending on him, he refuses Luther's demand to leave. Stating that people depend on him, Luther also refuses to back down. A fight ensues between them. Luther almost crushes Negan with a bear hug, after which Negan runs a cheese grater over his forehead. Releasing Negan, Luther steps back, stumbles and accidentally hits the back of his head on the pipe. Kneeling, Negan pushes Luther's head into the pipe and kills him. In the flashback, Negan realizes that the toy was stolen by the man who attacked them, finds it in the man's bag and returns it to Ginny, wrapping the hole in the toys with a bandage. Negan teaches Ginny the whistle that his wife Lucille used when she was sick and couldn't get out of bed, and which brought Negan to his senses, no matter what he did and wherever he was. After Ginny has learned to whistle, Negan promises that if she does it when he is not around, Negan will come. Negan and Ginny hug each other. In the present, which Ginny is secretly watching, Maggie prepares to burn a dinosaur toy in an old trash barrel while Negan moves away from Luther's body. However, looking at the burning match, Maggie doubts whether to do it, and hesitantly holds the match. The end of the third series. Shelter. Many years ago, the Croat broke the girl, who, according to him, was sent by the kingdom, disobeying a direct order to let her go free. Negan and Simon see the bloody results of the Horvath trial, the process during which the location of the weapon's cache in the hilltop was discovered. During the process, the girl is tied to a chair, from which blood flows, with wounds on her arms, legs, throat and head. Simon reminds the Slavic psycho that children are a trait that we don't cross. The Croat smiles and shrugs. And just like he told Maggie, he had one chance. Alone. Missed. Shot off his ear. I haven't seen or heard from him since. In the present tense, Negan, Maggie, and Maya and Tamaza are preparing an attack on the Croat's hideout. No one can find Luther, who died during a confrontation with Negan in the kitchen, so it is decided that he escaped. Negan quickly packs a jar of Luther's beeswax into his bag. Negan confesses to Maggie that he is not ready to meet the Croat. It's just starting to feel too familiar. As if if he starts talking, it won't be him at all. It will be an echo of some song that I don't want to hear anymore, Negan admits. Maggie remembers the time when her son Herschel was very young. Above them lived a man named Amos, who played the harmonica even at night. When talking to him didn't help, Maggie confesses, the next time he went hunting, I snuck into his room. I stole an accordion, went and buried it in the ground. Grinning, Negan retorts that Maggie has lost a couple of scout badges for this. She replies, yes, but I'm sure you would have buried it in a much worse place. He asks if she has seen his matchbox. She's lying. 
On the streets of New York, Maggie and Negan move in with the Amai and Tomaza tribe. The sewer is bubbling with methane. When they get on the subway, no one notices Ginny walking behind. The group makes its way along the zombie-polluted tracks of a long-abandoned subway to get to the old Penn Station, from where you can get to the Croats' new hideout, Madison Square Garden. Making her way through abandoned cells, Maggie frantically checks every room, but finds nothing but empty chairs and blood-spattered walls. At the end of the hallway, Maggie steps on a fresh trail of blood on the floor. The prisoner is a young guy, black hair, head down. Blood is pouring from his hands and feet. Negan examines the zombie boy. It's not him, Maggie sighs. It's not Herschel, but this is someone's child, and Negan subdues him with a knife to the brain. They are developing a plan. Maggie steals the car, and Negan lures the Croat into the garage. While Maggie and Negan are lured by Croats across half the city, and Maya and her people will deal with Barasi. You'll get your baby. We'll kill the psychopath. Everyone will get a prize. Maggie and Negan make their way into the bowels of the arena. Picking up Negan's matches, she asks if he has figured out how to lure the Croat to show himself. Negan is confident that their plan will work. We'll get your boy back. She is about to tell him about Ginny's dinosaur when she suddenly sees him. A jar of Luther's beeswax is in Nigan's bag. He tries to explain, but Maggie fights him off. Don't pretend like you've never done what needs to be explained, Negan tells her, but they don't have time to figure out what Negan did to Luther. Inside the arena, Negan lures the Croat out with a whistle. The whistle of the saviors. While this is happening, Maggie sneaks into a taxi and tries to start it, then quickly disappear. Noticing Ginny nearby, Maggie goes after her, and they find themselves in the arena, where people about Maya expected to find Barazi Horvath. When Negan approaches the garage, the Croat whistles in response. Suddenly, the arena comes alive with lights, canisters explode at the entrance to the arena, turning it into a deadly trap, and a horde of walkers pour in. There is no way out. Every exit is crawling with dead people. Hunters turned into prey. With melee weapons, Maggie's chain belt, wrenches, blades, the survivors make their way through the horde, but not everyone manages to get out alive. People are being torn apart and devoured. As Maggie makes her way through the crowd, a walker grabs Amaya and almost bites her, but she fights him off. Tameza is surrounded and disappears into the crowd of walkers. Returning to the garage, Negan evades the search for Barazi, but Horvath notices him. In the arena, Maggie, Amai, and Scavenger lock themselves in a cage with Ginny. Using a technique that Maggie learned while clearing prison fences, the women strike at the walkers pressed against the cage. She can't stand it. The four of them tear the soft panels from the arena cage and fall inside. They move as one, in a Spartan formation, making their way through the horde and piercing the brains of walkers as they move towards the exit. The scavenger is torn off and eaten alive, and the same fate almost befalls Amaya, until she is rescued by Tameza, who takes the three survivors out of the arena. On the rafters above, the Croat overtakes Nigan and meets him with an unexpected reaction, joy. Nigan. My brother. The Croat rejoices, laughing at his shot ear. He explains that Jerome's former savior told him about the war with Hilltop, the kingdom, and Alexandria, which ended with Rick Grimes ending Negan's rule. I should have been there. I can only imagine the damage Simon did. He never listened to you, says Horvath. It's okay that you lost the shelter, because I built a new one. And we will continue. We will build something bigger, stronger. The whole island will become our refuge, fueled by death in its depths. Negan demands to see the captured Croat, and is surprised to see Marshal Pulley Armstrong instead of Herschel. The Croat presents a gift to the pursuer of Nigan and shows with a gesture that he is acting in the spirit of friendship and brotherly love. Horvath throws Armstrong across the track and drops him onto the platform below. Not letting Zakonik fall backwards, Negan helps him up, and they run away together. Downstairs, Maggie, Ginny, Amai and Tamaza descend into the only escape route, the sewer, which, as Omia warned, is filled with dead people and methane gas. Tamaza goes down the stairs to the sewer, followed by Omia and Ginny. Maggie nods, letting the girl know that everything is fine. She's right behind them. Maggie closes the door behind her as best she can and goes down the stairs, disappearing into the pitch darkness. Elsewhere, Nigan and the lame Armstrong are settling into a shoe repair shop. Negan thinks they're together, 
but Armstrong pointed his gun at the fugitive. He quotes the codes that Negan violated under the laws of the New Babylon, Code 14, Section 2. Premeditated murder is defined as first-degree murder and is punishable by execution. For the murder of the magistrate and four other people, Nigan will be put to death without trial. But not without what may be my last words. Well, not you scars. The end of the fourth series. Maggie, Ginny, and the natives of New York, and Maya and Tamaza, like rats, fled in the tunnel under the new shelter, where the Croat replenishes his methane bank with fresh corpses. So the Croat feeds the beast, using the dead to power the arena. And Maya blames herself for leading the tribe into the Barazi trap, but Tamaza says that they should focus on getting out before they feel the effects of methane on themselves, a pulse, a jackhammer in the head, heavy eyes, and nausea. Elsewhere, Marshal Pulley Armstrong is holding a gun on Negan. Negan reminds him that his boat has already sunk, the Croats are keeping the island under lock and key, and Negan saved his ass. According to the Marshal, this does not absolve Negan from responsibility for the murder of the judge of New Babylon and four other people, but Negan calls it lynching for what these people did to his wife. In the sewers, Maggie's group stumbles upon a wall of grease. The hatches are sealed and they start coughing up methane. Maggie is angry that Ginny showed up on the island looking for Negan. You don't know the monster I know, she tells the girl. But if you stay here long enough, you'll find out. Armstrong persuades Negan to get to the Chelsea Pier. The marina has floating docks built on modular plastic pontoons cast from durable polyurethane foam, which means they will be able to sail off the island on their asses. Hiding from walkers in an old refrigerator turned into a secret entrance, Nigan and Armstrong stumble upon the body parts of a baby doll suspended from a bed spring. Mutilated dolls, a body with multiple limbs, a decapitated head with limbs may be the work of an avant-garde artist from the past, Nigan believes. Or the one who went crazy after, retorts Armstrong. Somewhere under the Danish cuisine, Tamaza separates from the group. He accidentally finds oxygen gas masks, thinking that they were left by Burazi. But Maggie suspected something. Amaya still can't figure out how the Croat found out about their appearance. Tamaza assumes that Luther warned him. After all, he disappeared right before the ambush. It was him, Maggie says, not Luther, Tamaza. He knew exactly how to get out of the arena. He knew he had to go to the sewer. And he knew how to get inside, that he took off his backpack before he found the oxygen tanks. He had the cylinders all the time, and he worked with the Croat all the time. Tamaza admits it, to take the island and win back his home from the Croat and his Barazi was a fantasy. Our house is no more, and Maya, he's gone. Everyone died. What I did was the only way out. I did it for you. Broken by the betrayal, Amai leaves, leaving Amaz alone with Maggie. The confrontation subsides, and he leaves without a fight. Back on the street, Negan pushes a walker into Armstrong and runs away. When he catches up with him, Negan explains why he saved him in the arena. He doesn't like leaving people to die. Even huge assholes. Negan offers to help the wounded Armstrong if he gives up the chase, but the marshal refuses. In the tunnels, Maggie offers a my shelter in bricks before fainting from methane. Through the fog, vague memories clear up in her mind. She remembers rushing after her son Herschel, whom the Croats had torn apart in bricks. She remembers how Negan blew Glenn's brains out. She remembers Herschel screaming for help. And she remembers Glenn dying. Then she came back. Tameza tries to explain herself. He surrendered their shelter in order to stay alive and return to Amaya. If he had brought their people to the Croats, he would have given them a boat and a way to leave the island. There is a place on the mainland where there are houses with kitchens, rooms for your belongings, a farm and a school for your children. The house. This shit seemed safe, he says, because everything was made of bricks. Before Maggie can answer, Maya screams. One of the many corpses piled up in the belly of the beast grabbed her. While Maggie is protecting Ginny, Tamaza does not have time to snatch Amaya from the mass of bodies pulling her into a pile. The walkers tear Amaya's stomach apart and sink their teeth into Tama's neck. Through his bloody mouth, he manages to utter the last words. It's all my fault. I've ruined everything. Maggie pierces his brain. At the King Theater, Francis Horvath walks into a luxurious back room and announces that his informant has been delivered. The threat from the tribe has been neutralized, and Negan is on the island. 
A woman who exudes elegance and elitism closes the book. Kerwin Lee Klein The Limits of the Historical Imagination The Narrative of the European Conquest of Native America 1891-1990 Sitting like a scolded child, the Croat shyly presents the badge of the Marshal of New Babylon. It's just like you said. There will be those who will try to bring everything back, the old laws and prisons to protect and serve, says the Croat. But in fact, as before, they just punish, steal and feed their fat bellies. Now they have come for what we have built. Something that belongs to us. Therefore, we must be ready. That's why we need him, says the lady. That's why you screwed up so badly. The Croat, kneeling next to her, promises to find him. There's no way Nigan's going to get off this island. When the lady holds out her hand, the Croat seals his promise with a kiss of her open palm, like a good dog. Returning to the tunnel, Maggie almost dies from methane. Ginny, using a gas mask, leads her along. Maggie hands her a container of water and tells her to get to the bricks. She then explains why she didn't tell Negan that Ginny was on the island. If she let him know she was here, everything would collapse. He will leave. He'll take you back. According to Maggie, a very bad man took all their grain and all the food, which took months to produce. And he will continue to take it, every harvest, until they starve to death. Worse, this bad man has her son. Nigan, the key to his return. Ginny nods. At first glance, Negan and Armstrong are hiding on a school bus. Even Negan doesn't know why he's helping a cop. I was lucky, they pinned your death on me, and I'm wanted twice as much. The next guy on my ass is much worse than you, I guarantee it. Armstrong tells Nigan about his brother Joel, a good man suffering from drug addiction, who once got so stoned that he broke into their parents' house and attacked their mother. Armstrong never spoke to his brother again. Three years after that, the city collapsed. He was left to die alone in the worst possible place on the planet, Armstrong says through gritted teeth. Did he deserve it? Is everything really so black and white? Under the city, Maggie and Ginny's exit is blocked by another pile of bodies, feeding animals. Maggie's foot got stuck in the squelching crowd of corpses at her feet. Heat and methane turned decomposing bodies into a mass of limbs, similar to a perverted art project. The six-armed walker crawls after Maggie, gets to his feet and discovers another half of the body connected to her side. It's a huge Frankenstein's monster of rotting flesh with teeth. And it's hungry. Maggie tries to escape from under the monster that has fallen on her. Two heads bite her when the third head bursts out of the chest cavity, like in the movie Alien. Then another head bursts through it. Maggie tries not to succumb to methane, fighting it off by hitting heads. All three. The six-armed walker falls. A fourth head appears, and Maggie stabs her too. She follows Ginny up the stairs. A message is written in blood for Maggie, liar. While Ginny crawls through the sewer tunnels, we find out what really happened in the bricks. Before escaping, Ginny climbed onto the grain bin and found that it was filled with grain. As Maggie weakly crawls after Ginny, she remembers what happened the night the Croats took Herschel. When the Baratsis were tearing Herschel away from Maggie, Horvath handed Maggie a piece of paper. But not just a piece of paper. It was Nig's wanted poster. Ginny gets out of the sewer and launches a flare, which is noticed by Negan. The end of the fifth series. Upon learning that the escaped Ginny is on Manhattan Island, Negan instructs Marshal of New Babylon Pearly Armstrong to escort her back to the bricks. I can't protect you and help Maggie. There was a plan, Negan scolds. She and I will come here, get Herschel, and you will stay with her people, where you are safe. That was the whole point, damn it. To keep you safe. Negan can't go with her, and Jeannie can't stay with him. I'm not who you think I am, he tells her. She finally spoke, for the first time since her father's death a few months ago. I want you to. But before she can say another word, Negan does the only thing he can do to make her leave. I killed your father, he tells her. I'm not wanted for robbing a wagon train. I killed five people. And your father was one of them. That's why I tracked you to the farm. Why I let you go with me because I knew you didn't have anyone. And you? You're just a debt that I had to pay. That's it. 
Ginny leaves without saying another word, and Negan sheds a tear. Later, Maggie and Negan inspect the arena where Krat founded his new shelter. Negan is confident that he will be able to negotiate with the former savior, who worships him. The dysfunctional duo takes to the streets and heads towards a building with black smoke billowing over it. The one from which smoke has been pouring out at the same time every morning and evening since Maggie and Negan arrived on the island. He asks Maggie what she thinks Ginny wanted to tell him. But Maggie is a bad liar, and Negan doesn't believe her arguments that she was trying to talk herself out of trouble. Maggie and Negan exchange glances. In the blink of an eye, Maggie and Negan both rush at her knife. He hits her against the wall, knocks off the weapon and throws her to the ground. Negan takes off, jumps over the railing and walks away along the beam. Maggie gives chase, trying not to run into a horde of walkers waiting for her downstairs. Negan tries to break out of the fight, but she beats him off with a knife. He overpowers the attacker and almost knocks her off the platform into the crowd of undead below. Negan screams for her to stop, but Maggie stabs him in the shoulder with her knife. The brawl ends with Negan putting a knife to her throat and ordering her to retreat. He realized that Maggie had lied about the circumstances of Herschel's abduction. The Croat did not steal their grain and did not extort the harvest. Horvath took her son because he wanted Maggie to bring Negan to him. He wanted me. And for what? Who knows? But whatever this crazy son of a bitch wants to do to me, I'm definitely not going to like it. You and I both know that, Negan tells her. The shittiest thing, Maggie, is that we could have done it. We could have saved Herschel. Because you and I are a damn cool team together. But you know that, don't you? Maybe there's a part of you that always wanted it to end this way. The thing is, Maggie, no matter what excuses I give you and how many apologies I make, you can't get over it. And it shouldn't. Before Negan can say another word about Glenn, they are found by Barassi Horvata. Holding Maggie's knife to Negan's throat, Horvath smiles. It turns out that the Croat returned to the Savior's shelter and found it abandoned, and after several months of searching on the mainland, he learned the widow's story from the former Savior. After learning about Maggie's history with Negan, vulnerabilities that can be exploited, according to Horvath, he realized that the abduction of Maggie's son is the push she needs to find Negan and bring him to New York. In the bank building, Maggie leads Negan inside like a man to the gallows, holding a knife to his throat. The Barazzis lead them to the vault. Just keep an eye on Ginny, okay? A repentant Nigan asks Maggie. That's all I'm asking. The door opens and Herschel appears in it. He is alive, there is hatred and anger in his eyes. Negan takes Maggie's hand, still clutching the knife, and lowers it. He accepts his fate and puts himself in the hands of fate. The exchange takes place at the moment when Herschel goes to Maggie, and Negan goes to the Croat. Good to see you, baby, says Nigan to Herschel, who quickly finds himself in his mother's arms. Back in New Babylon, Armstrong tells his director that he tracked the fugitive Negan to New York. He tried to escape, and Armstrong shot him. Negan is dead. It's a pity, she wanted Negan to be alive, to be executed and hanged, to be put on public display and make a statement. She unobtrusively reminds Armstrong that they followed his family, Marjorie, B and Desi, while he was away, protecting their political body. She reminds him that ethanol is made from corn, which occupies thousands of acres of fields. That's why I want you, Marshall, to tell me your story again. And this time I want you to tell me all about methane. In New York, Maggie and Herschel look at Liberty Island. Their conversation is laconic. At home, all we do is wait for the next trouble to happen, the teenager grumbles. If anything, I feel safer there. Maggie doesn't know what to say to that. He finds the baseball cap that Negan gave Maggie to give to Herschel, and sarcastically writes that it is a souvenir of the abduction. Finally, Herschel defuses the situation. It's like you're obsessed with Negan. On what he did. Bring him back, Herschel tells mom. Maggie objects that she came to New York for him, not for Negan. I'm here, but you can't see me, he replies. It's like you've been looking over my shoulder all your life, watching him, waiting for him. But you never see me. Maggie is crying. In the city, the Croat transports Negan in an ambulance and recalls how he handled the river people as an actor on stage with all the swagger of a rock star. But what is a rock star without a microphone? So Lucille showed up. 
Horvath says of Negan's barbed wire covered vampire bath. Then you turned around and offered her to me, I didn't get it. I've just arrived at the shelter, I was nobody, I was broken. But you saw something in me, not what I was, but what I could become. He worries about the wonderful brotherhood that they had in the shelter. The Croat tells his idol that he should not have disobeyed Nigan's orders and tortured the girl to death. I became a threat that had to be dealt with, he understands. I promise this will never happen again. In Bricks, Maggie checks on Ginny by slipping into the room to return her stuffed dinosaur, and slipping back out without saying a word. In Herschel's room, she apologizes to her son. For a long time, most of my life, I felt that the world continues to take away. I think at some point it seemed to me that if I fought with all my might, I could get everything back. At least a small piece, she admits. But that doesn't happen, because in the end you just lose what you have. And I don't want to do that anymore. I do not know how, but this story with Negan, I'm going to finish it. So that I can let it go. In New York, Horvath takes Negan to a lady. My battles with the tribe, the rats I had to exterminate, were training for the coming war. The lady says that when we get full control of the island, a clash of civilization will be inevitable. And when I told her about all the good things you've done, about the people you've saved and protected, she said you were the missing piece. He is like a child, happy that mom and dad got together. The lady, delighted that a rock star was sitting in front of her, waved him away. I heard about your speech at the bank. Taunts, jokes are an additional, but absolutely necessary pinch of cruelty, she says of his bloody knock-knock joke. Shock and awe and all that. Bravo. The lady hands Nigan an Armstrong Marshall badge. She explains that the new Babylonian Federation will come for their natural resource, methane, which the Croats shelter produces from corpses. The island needs leadership. Now more than ever, she says. Someone confident, fearless, charismatic, with a special, let's say, political talent. After all, what is politics if not execution? The tribe was destroyed, but the settlements remained as far as Harlem. The lady hands Nigan the keys to the kingdom in the literal sense of the word. If we can unite them under a single rule, we will be indomitable. And it can all be yours again. But first she has to make sure that Nigan, the one he used to be. Negan opens the box in front of him. Inside, the finger. Back in the bricks, Herschel is without shoes and a little finger on his foot. My former guest and I talked a lot. He told me a story about a man who killed a yogi father, not only in front of his mother, but also his unborn child in her stomach, says the lady. And I felt something in this story that he could not feel himself. That the murderer of his father may feel remorse, responsibility for the boy whose family he destroyed. Maggie makes up Ferschel's bed and finds his drawings. New York, a bank vault, a woman Maggie doesn't recognize. It's a lady. Of course, he only told me about it when he felt safe with me, she explains to Nigan. And here you are, coming all this way to save him. As you know, I finally let him go in exchange for you. But I kept a piece of him. And I can always come back for a new one. Negan sips his drink in silence. Let it be for a long time, she tells him. We have a lot to discuss. A lot needs to be planned. The screen is bifurcated. Maggie and Negan's faces become one. 